For our meditation this morning, will you turn with me, please, to the Gospel by Luke and chapter 24. The Gospel by Luke and chapter 24. I'd like to consider with you what we have in verses 13 to 35. This represents one incident. It is an incident only recorded in this detail in the Gospel of Luke, though it is mentioned, merely mentioned, in the Gospel by Mark and chapter 16, verse 12. But here is the incident in Luke chapter 24 and verses 13 to 35, focusing our minds on verse 32. They said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the Scriptures? Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the Scriptures. I dare say this is a sentiment that ought to be true of us every service. Not just with reference to the words of a preacher, but the fact that here we are sitting under the Word of God, under the Word of Jesus, and our desire should be that our hearts would burn within us as He talks with us and opens to us the Scriptures. To that end, we pray, of course, for the work of the Holy Spirit, that the Word would come with convicting power as well as comforting power, that the Word would come with uncommon grace to our hearts. I must say, when I come to this incident, this story that is uh, recorded for us here in Luke chapter 24 in these verses, I have to say, It is a precious story. I love this story. And when you read through it, don't you feel yourself um, coming alongside? Don't you feel yourself present with these disciples? And you feel as though you're listening into their conversation. You're eavesdropping, as it were, to a very precious conversation and experience of theirs in this particular incident. These verses comprise this one incident. We meet with two disciples on their way to a place called Emmaus. They are going from Jerusalem. And Emmaus, about six, well, it's described as 60 furlongs. That would be seven and a half miles or thereabouts between Jerusalem and Emmaus. It is early on the first day of the week, what we would call the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, the journey seven miles to the north and west of Jerusalem. These people are described as two disciples. We have the name of one of them, Cleopas, but not the other. So we can surmise where these two men, brothers, going back home, was it a man and a wife? Perhaps, perhaps a man and a sister. We don't know. But they were not among the eleven, because this is clear from verse 33. They went back to where the eleven were. One is called Cleopas, we read in verse 18. But the important thing is here that it was the day of the resurrection. The day of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's clear that there were rumors or stories going around about this. This is clear from what they say themselves to the stranger in verses 22 to 24. But these two disciples didn't didn't seem to know what to make of it all. We might picture them going back from Jerusalem and their heads were down and they were confused in a measure and they were, well, pessimistic. They are wearily winding their way home that Lord's Day and they are deep in conversation. It's not a conclusive conversation about the things that are reported to have happened. They talked together of all these things which had happened. And then, all of a sudden, a stranger draws near. We're told that their eyes were holden 
that they should not know him. That is to say, their eyes were restrained. They did not recognize him. They did not see that it was Jesus. It became clear, of course, in due time that this was, but this wasn't clear to them then. Normally, in this walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus, it would have been very pleasant. You can picture them walking back with the rich vegetation around, with perhaps the olive groves or the orchard and fruit trees along the road. But they weren't of a mind to take these sorts of things in. They had hopes concerning the Lord. We trusted that it had been He which should have redeemed Israel. Besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. They trusted that it had been He which should have redeemed Israel. And now, where their hopes dashed, they seem to be, they seem to be dashed, they are trying to make sense of all these reported events. The stranger who has come alongside them, you see, has asked them what they're talking about. Doesn't he know? All this is being spoken of all over the place, and they tell him in verses 19 to 24, how does this stranger who comes alongside them react to this situation? We are told, of course, in verse 15, who he is. Their eyes were holding, but we are told who he is. Verse 15, you see, as they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. What a lovely thing is that. Jesus himself drawing near and going with them. Now important for us. Jesus drawing near and going with us. They had the privilege and wonder of the risen Lord coming alongside them in his physical presence. But we have the Holy Spirit who takes the things of Christ and brings them home to our hearts. But how does this stranger, Jesus, react to this situation? I'd like to bring out this morning three things. First of all, notice, unbelief is rebuked. Unbelief is rebuked. We have this in verses 25 to 27. Given Jesus' response, it's clear that these disciples were doubting and downcast. And you can imagine how that would be. The Lord Jesus in these past days had been crucified. There had been reports of a resurrection, but they couldn't seem to relate these things to the question of redemption. Their hopes seemed to be dashed. Was it all lost? And how often it is that professed disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ look at the things that are seen rather than trusting in the word that is received. Jesus had told them what things would happen, you see, beforehand. And Jesus doesn't deal with Cleopas and his companion lightly. Oh, no. What does he do? He utters a strong rebuke. Oh, how often we need rebukes for our want of faith and faithfulness. How often? Oh, foolish Fools, he says, foolish ones, fools, and slow in heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. This is strong language. This exclamation, fools. We would hesitate to use this speaking to anyone, but this stranger uses it of these, of these disciples. Strong language, especially when you think that these were described as disciples, two of them. Slow in heart to believe, he says. How true it is that we can be slow in heart to believe. To believe what? All that the prophets have spoken. Of what had the prophets spoken that was relevant in this conversation? They had spoken of the Messiah, of the coming one, and what he would do and who he was in himself. 
His coming, His ministry, His death, His resurrection, His sufferings, and His entering into glory. They speak of the irresistible power, purpose, and grace of God. The prophets did. And the stranger opens this all up for them. From Moses, and from David, and from Isaiah, and from Micah, and from Zephaniah, and from Malachi, and the Old Testament Scriptures. Do you remember what, what uh, Jesus says in the rich man and Lazarus parable in Luke's gospel concerning the brothers of the rich man? The rich man himself, the rich man himself was languishing in hell. And we have this picture, this insight. He speaks across the divide where Lazarus is in Abram's bosom. And what is his desire then? Well, there's the water to cool his tongue. But that Lazarus would go back to his brothers, his five brothers, so that they might not come where he was, where the rich man was. He realizes, you see, that these brothers of his were in the same plight as he had been. And if they went on in that way, they would end where he ended in this place of great separation, this great divide beyond. Do you remember what Abraham says? If they do not hear, if they do not believe Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. This is the rub, you see. All are simply to believe in the word concerning Jesus. We are not to be slow in heart to believe all that the Word of God has spoken. And we have more, because we have the full light of the New Testament and the giving of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost besides. We have within our grasp the true and full knowledge of Christ and His saving work. And my dear friends, do you not know it is our only hope? But their unbelief at that point, was rebuked. Fools and slow in heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. But things go on. Secondly, the Lord is revealed. We have this in verses 28 to 31. Now, recognize that these strangers to whom Jesus drew alongside they didn't re recognize that it was Jesus. Yet, despite being roundly rebuked, they did not react in an offended way. This is very significant. We can often so easily be offended. Churches can be destroyed by people taking offense about things that are said by one person or another. If someone tries to tell us that we are doing wrong or thinking wrong, immediately, so often, our hackles rise. Who is he or who, are, who is she to tell us this or to tell me this? And I think in this context, there are some lessons. I'd just like to bring out four. First of all, there is a lesson here, surely, in openness to rebuke. Bear in mind what they heard, fools and slow in heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. There's a lesson of openness to rebuke. This is one way a church progresses in the things of the Lord, when there is such openness. Otherwise, the spiritual life of a congregation may be clogged with pride or moral and spiritual slackness because of indiscipline. And indiscipline often arises because of a lack of responsiveness to rebuke or openness to rebuke. When these people came to Emmaus, they were not happy to bid the stranger farewell. Despite the rebuke, no indeed, they wanted to hear more. That's very significant, I think. An openness to rebuke. But there's a lesson here also in hospitality. They constrain him, even when he makes to go on. That is, that is quite a, shall we say, pregnant moment. We have in verse 28. 
They drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. They constrain him. Abide with us. Stay with us. And he went in. Verse 29. But it's not just a case of willingness to give hospitality of our homes. There is also this, a lesson in eagerness. And this is, this is the important point and the significant point in this incident, in this record. There is an eagerness to hear more of the truth, or we might say, a lesson in fellowship. Now that's a mark of grace. We are fond of rationing things as far as hospitality is concerned or as far as fellowship is concerned. I mean, would we really take in a stranger we just met on the road, a person we, re we reckoned to be a stranger that we just met on the road, even if he were an interesting stranger? Of course, we understand. He touched a chord in their hearts, didn't he? He created a hunger for in them concerning what he had been speaking about. He'd opened to them the Scriptures. And there was a hunger stirred in their heart for more of this, more of this. But what sort of hunger do you and I really have for the Word of God and for the fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, for a thirst, my dear friends, for the truth as it is in Jesus. Oh, for a thirst for communion with the Lord Jesus Christ and with one another of his people. How encouraging and stirring and strengthening this must be. Presupposing that there is in our communing the desire positively for us to know more of the truth, to experience more of it in our lives. And we are stirring one another up in it. My dear friends, a church will not make much progress without this. The hospitality, as it happens, was a simple meal. It is described as breaking of bread which is not, of course, to say that it was the Lord's Supper. It wasn't that. It was hospitality. It was a normal sort of simple meal. But, you know, hospitality is mark of a Christian church. This is clear from what we have on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and verse 46. Are we falling short of this mark of an apostolic church? We might ponder this, for example, in relation to what we read in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. But fourthly, there is another lesson here I would suggest, and that is a lesson of reward. What reward they received for asking the stranger in. We read in verse 35 that he is revealed to them in the breaking of bread. Their eyes are open and uh, they, they recognize him. They recognize him. Verse 31, you see. Their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. Let us think of this in a slightly different way. I mentioned, I mentioned uh, verse 28. Uh, he made as though he would have gone further. Let us just suppose for a moment that they had not asked him in. Suppose they had let him go on. What would have been the consequence of that? Well, it is quite clear they would have missed the blessing. They would have missed the blessing. There would have been no going back to Jerusalem. He would not have been revealed to them as the Lord Jesus Christ in the breaking of bread. They would have missed seriously. Jesus writes to the churches of Asia Minor, most especially in connection with the lukewarm church in Laodicea. 
neither hot nor cold. I will spew thee out of my mouth. And he gives them this, 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 this exhortation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, he says. It's in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. And although it is said with reference particularly to the church in Revelation uh, in, in, in Laodicea, no doubt it applied to them all. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The question for the Laodiceans, for the other churches, and for yours and mine, will he open the door? Will he have admittance? Will they give hospitality to the Son of God? This applies to the true church, which by its insipid life, by its weak doctrine, by its disorderly behavior, leaves Christ outside. That's what they effectively do. Leave Christ outside. As well as to an adherent who despite regular attendance upon the gospel, fails to repent and believe in the gospel. What are they doing? Leaving Christ outside. And what would be missed? Oh, sweet fellowship. Grace. The power of the Holy Spirit. And in the case of the persistently impenitent, of course, heaven itself. Oh, for a spirit of hospitality towards the Lord Jesus Christ and other believers, and for an opening of the eyes of faith by which he is perceived and consequently heartily adored. The Lord is revealed. But then thirdly, notice the experience that is confessed. Verses 32 to 35. We might say, given what transpired here, little wonder these disciples did what they did. Did they stay put and just uh, reflect upon this for their own lives? No, they didn't. You can imagine that when they came uh, from Jerusalem to Emmaus, they were downcast. We might say, you can picture them trudging their way back these seven, seven and a half miles. Weary. They meet with this stranger. They bring him into their house. Their eyes are opened, finally, to recognize through the breaking of bread that this is Jesus. What do they do? They can't contain themselves. All that weariness of the past is gone. It's gone. And they go back these seven miles to Jerusalem. And remember that uh, they drew nigh, they drew nigh, the, 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 night, the day was far spent. We, we read in verse 29, abide with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is far spent. That was the situation. They were going home in the light, but here was the dusk, or it was getting dark. But they go back. Nonetheless, they go back, and very quickly... Think of how they felt now. This past hour had been for them such an education. Spiritually and doctrinally, it had been an education for them. This was not something cold or clinical. True Christian faith is not like that. In true Christian experience, the word and the doctrine and the theology are nothing if they don't touch the heart. The mind and the heart are touched by it. How did they feel and how did they express themselves? The only way they could, because this had touched their hearts. Did not our heart burn within us as he spoke with us by the way and opened to us the word of life, the word of God? 
Are we so cold, my dear friends, that we are not moved under the hearing of the word? Is our religion so lifeless that we don't feel it? Is Christ so little to us that we are unresponsive to his word? What has happened to the experiential religion so characteristic of our Puritan forefathers? How are we so little moved of love to the Lord Jesus Christ or moved by the power of truth? Are we so dull? Are we so unresponsive to the promptings of the Spirit whom the risen Lord sent from heaven? The saintly Samuel Rutherford says at the end of one of his letters written from prison in Aberdeen, Jesus Christ came into my prison last night and every stone in it glowed like a ruby. Oh, my dear friends, the Christian ought to desire such an experience of the Lord, what Rutherford called a felt Christ, a felt Christ, so that he or she is able to speak thus, did not our hearts burn within us as he spoke with us by the way and opened to us the word of life. Whenever you go on your knees with the word of God open before you, whenever you come into the place of public worship and the word is opened and you take his songs upon your lips and the word is preached, did not our hearts burn within us? Oh, very often we are cold. It applies to the pulpit as well as to the pew. But this is how it should be when the word is opened. Such precious and real experiences, my dear friends, will be, will be felt also the more we devote ourselves to prayer and communion with God and leave off the dull and half-hearted and yet lukewarm in Christian things. Be discerning of them. Search your own heart about these things, about why there is coldness in your heart, unresponsiveness, and often backslidings as well. My dear friends, we need to believe more on Christ, talk more about Christ, pray more, love more the truth, and to be more diligent in the means of grace. What a sad thing it is when people are, become less diligent in the things of grace. They, they fall off a bit. What about, what is the prayer meeting to you, for instance? Is there a desire in your heart to be in the place of prayer, the place where prayer is one to be made, to offer up our united desires to Him, or the place of private devotion and communion with God? You see, this puts the world, this puts the world, the things of this world in the right perspective. It challenges us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteous, to rejoice in Jesus Christ as our teacher, as our confidant, as our friend, as our hope. All in dependence upon the work of the Holy Spirit. Let me summarize by bringing out some further lessons as we conclude this afternoon. First of all, let us remember, in, in, as far as this incident is concerned, that we are dealing here with a further testimony to the risen Lord, to the resurrection and to the risen Lord, and consequently, testimony to the accomplishment of his saving work because the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is the seal upon, or we may say the, the, the reward of the Father upon the Son, the seal upon what was accomplished at Calvary. Paul says, Paul, uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ be not risen, we're still in our sins. We're, 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 there is no salvation for us. The resurrection was a necessity so that that work that was done on the cross was confirmed, redemption confirmed through his, through his resurrection. The accomplishment of his saving work 
culminating in his sacrifice for the sins of all his people. But people seem to see, see no further than the things seen. True faith, you see, sees the invisible. Biblical faith rests upon a risen Savior who did redeem his people by his death and gives them a glorious hope through the resurrection. Glorious hope through the resurrection. And this incident is another testimony to it. Another testimony to it. And foolish indeed are we, my dear friends, if having his word and this testimony actually more than the disciples had. Uh, uh, foolish are we if we fail to trust in this glorious revealed Savior. What a cordial this is for a day such as ours. But then, secondly, let us by all means not fail to give hospitality to Jesus. Christ is always knocking at the door of the church and indeed of our lives. How easily we keep thought of him out, but what blessing there is of fellowship with him as we give ourselves to him and to his word as our lamp and as our light. My dear friends, precious Savior, precious Savior, what an incentive to go boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. But then there is this as we close. Let us by all means cultivate a hunger and thirst for spiritual things. One of the things which impresses uh, one of these disciples is, uh, impresses us about these disciples is that despite it being evening, despite it being dusk, they went back seven miles to Jerusalem to share their experience. Think of the contrast between verse, verse 17 and verse 32. Trudging back home with heavy heart, now in light step as they hasten back to tell that they have seen Jesus, they have met with Jesus. Who cares about the discomfort? Who cares about the hour? Who cares about the inconvenience? Beloved, here is a message to believe. Here is a fellowship to enjoy. Here is a truth to share. It seems to fit in well with the observance of the Lord's Supper, incidentally. Christ is known in the breaking of bread. As you sit around the table of the Lord, that is your experience. His broken body and his shed blood are represented in these elements. And you are meeting, he is meeting you. You are meeting him by the way. And he is opening to you the word of life. Oh, let us cultivate eagerness about this. Let us cultivate zeal for the things of God. Let us cultivate love for him. So that in relation both to public and private exercises and family exercises of worship, we might have a hunger and might have an excitement so that we may have a desire for fellowship with the risen Lord by His Spirit and with His people. This, of course, is a mark of grace. My dear friends, may we all know it, or come to know it, those of you who are still without God and without hope in the world. Oh, may this day not close and find you in that state, but that before this day closes, you will be found coming to Christ, receiving Christ, being responsive to his call, being responsive to his word, being responsive to his claims, being responsive to his person. That is your only hope, and that is the only hope of any man, woman, or child in this world in the face of our death. Ultimately, you see, that is the one thing needful in which our hearts should burn within us. 
May the Lord bless these thoughts upon his word. Let us pray. How thankful we are, Lord, that thou hast been pleased to reveal thyself in thy word. Thou hast revealed thyself in thy Son, and thou hast revealed him through thy word. And we pray that thou wouldst grant that in our own hearts we would recognize the need of thy Holy Spirit, so that our hearts would burn within us as thou dost speak with us by the way and open to us thy word. O oh, Lord our God, grant a desire in our hearts and lives for fellowship, sweet fellowship with Christ, knowledge of him, love to him. And Lord, forbid that we would go through our days with coldness and dullness towards the son of thy love. Look upon us then in mercy. Bless thy word to mind and heart and conscience and forgive all sin for his sake. Amen.